up with the water by the computer. If he jumps on the table, <laughs> it's the end of the computer. We'll start. Sh Early birds will start shortly, just making a pit stop here of water and espresso. Five seconds. I'm going to ask Darren to make copies of the long prayer, right? The one that yeah, the one that we don't, nobody has. Yeah. Good evening. It's 7 o'clock. This is the Tibet Center, Kunshab Tardulinga Buddhist Meditation and Study Center located in New York City in northern New Jersey under the direction of Chabjay, His Eminence Chabjay Ling Rinpoche and also under the direction of Rato Kensa Tupton Lunda, also known as Geshe Nikki Vreeland. This is our twice-weekly presentation of the Buddha Dharma. Specifically tonight, we're continuing with our tribute to Lama Zopa, reading from his book, The Door to Satisfaction, lectures that he gave in 1990 at the Root Institute in Bodh Gaya, nicely edited by Venerable Robin, Robina Corton, C-O-U-R-T-I-N, and also uh, Alisa Cameron. I don't know if she's ordained and a venerable or not, so, but... Excellent job. The language flows. It's very date, modern and easy to pick up the meaning. So it's about what we're studying on the, in the 13th chapter of Lama, emptiness, and actually how to put it into use. Um, any problems with the picture sound, let myself and Darren Smith know right away so we don't waste time. All the prayers we say are on the Tibet Center website in the FAQ section. If there's anyone for whom you want us to pray, when we do the Sutra, the Recollection of Three Jewels, as soon as possible, excuse me, put their names in the uh, chat box or comment section or whatever they call it these days. Every day it's a new, a new word. So I'm not up on anti-social media or social media, whatever. Um, prayer for the spreading of the teachings throughout the length and breadth of the West. By the force of the blessings of the non-fallacious three precious gems and of the truth of our pure selfless wishes, may the precious Buddhist teachings flourish and spread to the expanse of all areas throughout the length and breadth of the West. For all the people living here, together with their near ones, who have engaged in the teachings and have faith and respect for them, may all conditions adverse to their practice of the pure Dharma be dispelled, and an excellent collection of favorable conditions increase like the waxing moon and especially for those who work on methods to accomplish the flourishing and spreading of the victorious one's teachings, which are the source of benefit and happiness. May they never be oppressed by masses of interference and adverse conditions, and may this spontaneously happen just as we have hoped and wished. The Heart Sutra. Thus have I heard once the Blessed One was dwelling in the royal domain of the Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a big gathering of great monks and great bodhisattvas, at that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi, which examines the Dharma as called profound illumination. And at the same time, Noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, looking at the profound practice of transcendent knowledge, saw the five skandhas and their natural emptiness. Yeah. Then, through the inspiration of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to Avalokiteshvara, how should those noble ones learn who wish to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge? And Navalokiteshvara answered, Venerable Shariputra, whoever wishes to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge should look at it like this, seeing the five skandhas and their natural emptiness. Form is empty, emptiness itself is form, emptiness is not separate from form, form is not separate from emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discriminating awareness, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Thus all the dharmas are empty and have no characteristics. They are unborn and unceasing. They are not impure or pure. They neither decrease nor increase. Therefore, since there is emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discriminating awareness, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no sensation, no objects of mind, no quality of sight, no quality of hearing, no quality of smelling, no quality of tasting, no quality of sensing, no quality of thought, no quality of mind consciousness. There are no nidanas from ignorance to old age and death, nor their wearing out. There is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no ending of suffering, and no path, no wisdom, no attainment, no non-attainment. Therefore, since there is no attainment, 
the bodhisattvas abide by means of transcendent knowledge. And since there is no obscurity of mind, they have no fear. They transcend falsity and pass beyond the bounds of sorrow. All the Buddhas who dwell in the past, present, and future by means of transcendent knowledge fully and clearly awaken to the unsurpassed, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of transcendent knowledge, the mantra of deep insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequaled mantra, the mantra which calms all suffering should be known as truth, for there is no deception. In transcendent knowledge, the mantra is proclaimed, Tayat Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisoha. O Shariputra, this is how a Bodhisattva Mahasattva should learn profound transcendent knowledge. Then the Blessed One arose from that Samadhi and praised the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Avalokiteshvara, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family, profound, transcendent knowledge should be practiced just as you have taught, and the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Shariputra and Avalokiteshvara, that whole gathering in the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, their hearts full of joy, praise the words of the Blessed One. And now refuge and bodhisattva vow, which of course we say three times. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. May all the pains of living creatures ripen solely upon myself, and through the might of the Bodhisattva Sangha, may all beings experience happiness. May the teachings which are the soul medicine, medicine for suffering and the origin of every joy be materially supported and honored and abide for a very long time. I prostrate to Manjagosha through whose kindness wholesome minds ensue, and I prostrate to my spiritual masters through whose kindness I develop. So when you recite this three times, the third repetition, repu, repetition, you should imagine you're getting the vow. That's that's what I was told. So I don't want to know. Yeah. Now, as a course, with a swift return to our field of vision, by Rato Chungla Rinpoche, His Holiness has written this prayer, a prayer for a swift return, on the website where everything else is, the FAQ section. Exalted wisdom of all victors gathered in a drop, soul refuge manifest in the form of the one wearing saffron robes, Guru Lazang Tubuang Dorje Chang. Please bear witness here today that our prayers may be fulfilled. We beseech the great so torch of doctrine, accomplishing from long ago the vast waves of aspirational prayers, Lord of speech of the Victor Lazang's teachings, spreading them to the ends of the earth by means of explanation and practice. Though holding the commitment, I will invite all beings to be my guests in unsurpassed great awakening. Yet you have withdrawn the activities of the form body that serves the welfare of others. Is that worthy of the supreme among beings, the bodhisattvas? And though impossible for you till septic existences end to abandon your commitment to liberate all beings, we beseech the new son of Nirmanakaya to swiftly return from the realm of Dharmakaya, brought forth by Bodhicitta, drawn by seven steeds. Having reached the far limits of scholarship, religious life, and goodness, please come swiftly as an unrivaled supreme emanation, full holder of the sage's teachings and wish-fulfilling jewel, return as the glory of Lozang Tempe, magnificent truth of the three precious jewels, Mahakala, Karma, Yama, and Sri Mata Devi, and the ocean of Dharma protectors, may you spontaneously fulfill our wish, the swift blossoming of the reincarnation's fresh moonlight face. So now we're coming to 
the halfway point. We're going to go through the whole chapter, uh, chapter 8 in this book called The Door to Satisfaction. It's now available. You can get it from Amazon or if you want to help a Buddhist center. You can get it from the KTD bookstore. Uh, I think it's called Namse Bagzo Bookstore on the web. Uh, they both sell at moderate price, 15 bucks, something like that. Well worth it. So uh, we'll be looking for Lama Zofa. That's, I'll, I'll pick it up from there, even though you know, we did that a little before. What he's doing in this chapter is telling us how to meditate on emptiness. It's repetitive because it's spoken verbally, and as you when you preach, you'll repeat things because you know, the audience doesn't get it. But it's just the way even the sutras repeat, repeat. But he's doing it with ordinary language. There's no technical terms here, you know, the perceived object, the, the apprehended object, the this or that, this school, that school, no. You see, walking around in everyday life, how you should see things and how you should meditate on emptiness. For simple folks like myself, it's very, very helpful. It's a blessing to hear him. So he's got to come back quick. We want to hear more. <laughs> yeah. So this is from page 94. Looking for Lama Zopa. And uh, I don't know, it's funny because, you know, we can't see his form anymore, at least those of us who are normal. Uh, but you can imagine him on a throne at Root Institute in Bodhi Gaya in 1990, 91, something like that, 1990, a while ago. He, he starts, looking for Lama Zopa. When you look at me, there seems to be a real Lama Zopa existing from the side of the object but this is completely opposite to reality. The way that Lama Zopa appears to exist is not the way that Lama Zopa really exists. This is going to be reiterated over and over again, like a theme in a symphony. Very necessary, very important. Why? Because the mind says, yeah, I know that, but then it flips on and goes up. Keep bringing that back. So you break this trap that we're in of samsara, the mental trap. He continues, we are living our lives in a big hallucination. We lack the awareness that the, that the way everything appears to us as real from its own side is a hallucination. We're not aware of that. The, quote, real Lama Zopa means the one that has existence from its own side, from our point of view. When we say, quote, real, we actually mean truly existent. If you do not see things as illusory, when you talk of real, you mean truly existent. And most folks don't know the underlying reality of things. He continues on page 95. There is no Lama Zopa on these aggregates, the collection of physical and mental components that make up a person. That real Lama Zopa from its own side cannot be found. From the top of my head down to my toes, there is no Lama Zopa here. Lama Zopa is nowhere to be found. In this world, in Bodhi Gaya, in these aggregates, it is nowhere. The whole group of the five aggregates, form, feeling, recognition, we say discriminating awareness, uh, compounded aggregates, we say compositional things, no big deal, unconsciousness is not Lama Zopa. And none of the aggregates individually is Lama Zopa. To ex express it another way, besides this body not being Lama Zopa, even this mind is not Lama Zopa. Lama Zopa cannot be found anywhere. From the crown of my head down to my toes, this is a simple, short, and effective way to meditate on emptiness. Or you could say, I don't exist anywhere. This eye is not here, like that. Anyway, let, let him continue. I'll shut up, I promise. But Lama Zopa is not non-existent. Now here's the problem. At this time, what is called Lama Zopa exists in this world, in India, in Bodhi Gaya, in Root Institute. Right now, in Root Institute, Lama Zopa is performing the function of talking with noises coming from the mouth and the nose from time to time. <laughs> He had us that a call. But the existence of Lama Zopa is something completely other than what you normally think. The reality is somewhere else. Completely something else. It's something else. The reality of the way Lama Zopa exists is extremely subtle. This will be repeated. Subtle. Keep that in mind. It's not, oh yeah, I know it. A, 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 a little finesse here. A little mental finesse has to be applied. The, way, the reality of the way Lama Zopa exists is extremely subtle something we don't normally think about. The way we normally apprehend, La apprehend Lama Zopa has nothing to do with the way Lama Zopa exists. The way Lama Zopa exists is completely something else. Completely something else. So, how does Lama Zopa exist? 
Well, he continues, what is the I? If you label I on a table, a bicycle, a car, a rock, how do you feel? Hmm. If you label on a TV set what you normally, usually label on the aggregates, how do you feel? TV set is not I, no. Hmm. Let's say there's a scarecrow in a field protecting the crops from the crows. When you are at a distance and unable to see it clearly, you might think it's a person. When you get nearer, you see that it is only a scarecrow. How do you feel when what you have previously labeled as a person turns out to be a scarecrow? Now, this we should meditate on. You should think, how do we feel when that actually happens? He's going right in, and this is easy to do. No scholarship, no high words. No. Simple. How do you feel about your previously imputed label of person? You, call, you thought that scarecrow was a person. Now, how do you feel? Examine that. There's the mechanism of mistake that he wants to bring up to us. He continues on page 96 of this book, in case you forgot, The Door to Satisfaction. A different cover now, but same stuff. How do you feel when a relative dies and you are left with just their empty name? How do you feel about that name? The person is dead. You cannot see their body. There is nothing that you can see. So how do you feel about their name? He recited this and that. They seem like illusions, don't they? This is very important now, this passage. This is how those who have realized emptiness feel about actual living beings. They understand everything in this way. The I, all existence, samsara and nirvana. Those experienced meditators see everything as illusory. And this is reality. This is how everything exists in reality. The way things exist is extremely subtle. That word again. Almost as if they don't exist. You cannot say that they completely don't exist, but it is very easy to say that they don't exist to come to the point of nihilism. It is a very subtle point. So we have to hold that thought when we're investigating. You can see why so many people have difficulty understanding the prasamika madhyamika view of subtle dependent arising. Subtle dependent arising. Pardon me? I need to fuel the machine. <laughs> he continues, we become so confused. Our problem is that if we accept that something exists, we tend to think it exists from its own side. That's the way we see everything now. Whether we've been told or not, he's telling us, hello, there's another reality. It is difficult to understand that something can still exist while being empty of existence, existing from its own side. That is, not truly existent in nature. It is hard to accept these two views on the basis of one object. Because these two views are difficult to unify, many people fall into the extreme view of saying that the object does not exist. They are unable to enter the middle way, the madhyamika. They assert that if an object does not exist from its own side, then there's no way that it can exist. That's that. Such people then arrive at the philosophy that nothing exists and that what appears to exist is a hallucination. Let him continue because the correct view is extremely subtle. By analyzing the example of Lama Zopa, you can see that it is extremely subtle. Lama Zopa exists in dependence on, in dependence on the, the aggregates, upon the aggregates rather. It is as simple as that. This is the reason that Lama Zopa is here now in this tent. Lama Zopa exists independent upon the aggregates. That is why he is here. But what Lama Zopa is, is extremely subtle. Which is why I say it is as if it doesn't exist. As if it is an illusion. So we've got to have patience. We have to play with these ideas. Think of the mistake we made. We thought that was a person. How do we feel? What was the mechanism that immediately jumped to that? Things that he continues. This is a meditation manual. You can just read this, and this is meditating on emptiness. Looking for things other than the eye. Now he brings it home. Yeah. Moi. <laughs> In a similar way that you meditate on the selflessness of persons refuting your own eye, you can meditate on the selflessness of the aggregates or of everything else that exists. Those not familiar with the subject may not realize that this self, that this word self and selflessness can refer to anything. Yes, it would normally say self, you mean people, everything else. It also could be the self of the horse, the self of whatever. 
of the object. It does not necessarily refer to the person or self. There is also the selflessness of the aggregates. Look at everything here. And this is interesting now. You could imagine, because we're not there, but he's, he's got a throne. He says, look at everything here. Table, brocade, light, walls, curtains, flowers, action, objects, sense objects. You have to understand that the way all these things are appearing to us is a complete hallucination. To him, probably not, but he's saying us to be kind. Uh, by analyzing the example of Lama Zopa, you can see how we are completely trapped in a heavy hallucination, which has nothing to do with reality. When we apprehend, what we apprehend has nothing in the slightest to do with reality. He continues, next paragraph. For example, we label table on this object that performs the function of supporting things. Mainly because this function is independent, mainly because of this function, independence upon this function, we label this particular shape table because it does that, we label it. However, when we, whenever we point, what, wherever we point, that is not the table. Each part, each piece of wood, the top, the bottom, the four legs, is not the table. Even the whole thing, all the parts together, which performs the function of supporting things, is not the table. The whole group of the parts is not the table. That's the base, the base upon which we label table. So now we have to put in our mind base and label. It's an important exercise. So the table cannot be found on this anywhere. There is no table on this, but there is a table. All right, already is a table. <laughs> Don't lose patience. <laughs> but there is a table. Independence on the base. The table, there is a table here. There is no table that can be found on this base, but there is a table here because there is the base, and the base was labeled table. It is just that there is no table that you that can be pointed to and found on this base. Again, the way the table exists in reality is completely different from the way we normally think of its existence. We have no choice then to conclude that you know, um, this is me talking. It's an imputation, that's all. You know the, so this will get over and over again here and in our chapter. He continues on page 97, going into page 98, boys and girls. What appears to us and what we apprehend have nothing to do with the reality of the table. The reality is completely something else. When we analyze what the table is, trying to see the reality of the table, how it actually exists, we discover that the table is something other than what we normally think of as a table. Now from this you can see the hallucination. Table is merely imputed, merely a concept. Concepts come from where? From us. In the sense that it has no existence from its own side. On this base, there is no table, but there is a table here. Because there is the base, that's why. There's a table because of the base, and we conveniently label the table. That's it. That's all there is. There's nothing hard. This table exists depend independence on the base. Table is simply an idea. It is simply an idea. The aggregates are simply an idea. Your form, your feeling, simply an idea. A concept labeled on a base. Now the lights have gone out. It's India. The lights went out. Hey, <laughs> and it happens in Jersey too. This is a very good example of true existence. Truly existent darkness. Unlabeled darkness. Darkness from its own side. He's carrying on. This is a very good example of the object to be refuted. Light, darkness. There is light from its own side. Then suddenly there is darkness from its own side. Even though in reality the darkness exists as a mere imputation, it does not appear to us like this. Like the table, like Lama Zopa, when the darkness is suddenly experienced, it appears to be truly existent. That's heavy. That's hard to understand. But I, I will take his word for it and go over the thoughts like this to break down the normal patterns in our mind. Look at the whole of existence in the same way. Everything is like this. Your own eye, aggregate, sense objects, samsara, nirvana, the way it's everything, the way in which everything Subject, action, object, all the six sense objects actually exist is what? Very subtle. The next section is called the base is not the label. Now this is important because we have to go about separating base, label. That's when we enter in with our minds and say, well, this is this, that's that. And the mind conveniently is categorizing. 
but we don't think it's just a mere category. We think it's uh, the base is not the label. Page ninety eight. Look at the nature of everything in this way. The label is imputed to the base, and in turn, that base is also labeled on another base. By nature, everything is merely imputed. In this way, everything is like an illusion. Nothing exists from its own side, but everything appears as if it does. We label aggregates on the base because the base is something that is not the aggregates. The label and the base have to be separate. First, you think of the reason then a particular label is given by the mind. Otherwise, without the reason, there's no way to apply the label. With the five aggregates, first you think of the reason, the characteristics and function of each aggregate, then you label form on the one that has color and shape and is tangible. In a similar way, you label feeling, recognition, compounded aggregates, and consciousness. Label logically on what the function is, etc. The label ain't the base. <laughs> Why is he repeating that? Because we put them together. Take consciousness, for example. Because of its function of thinking of an object's meaning and of distinguishing it from other objects, that particular phenomena is labeled consciousness or mind. The phenomena that perform such functions as remembering contacts with sense objects through seeing, hearing, and so on, carrying imprints to the next life and con continuing from one life to another is labeled consciousness or before you label this is my father on one person in a group of people you think of the reasons the particular shape of his body his function in relation to you oh you recognize oh that's my father is the name father your father no the base the label by remembering the woman who has a particular body shape and a particular relationship to you amongst hundreds of people you label that particular shape mother it is the same when you say, this is my enemy, this is my friend. He snuck that in very carefully, very smartly. If you could see, this is my enemy, this is my friend, there's labels, it takes a lot of the pull out of it. You won't go crazy, too affectionate towards one, too hateful to the other. That's what he's driving at here. Um, I'm going to skip the little paragraphs he talks about AIDS. It was current in the day. Probably today, talk about COVID. Page 100. The base versus the name this little section is about. And why do we have to go through this? Because we got to deconstruct the way we see reality. And one way of doing it is to make sure the label is a convenient designation by the mind. It's not inherent in the thing itself. So, page 100. 100. Whenever we label anything, we label on something that is not that label. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Why? Take a child who was called Behram Singh. They're in India, so he didn't pick George or something. <laughs> the base is the child aggregates, the association of body and mind. If those aggregates already bur Behram Singh, why did the parents have to give them a name? No. So the base is different from the name. Why did the parents have to decide a name to give? Why did they have to think of and give the name Behram Singh? Singh. Singh. How do you pronounce it? Singh? I don't know. If the base is Berham Singh, why do the parents have to give a name at all? There would be no point if a name is already there. The parents gave the name Berham Singh because the base is not Berham Singh. This is the reason they label Berham Singh on that base. Sounds confusing, but he's repeating it deliberately. We have the simple way of understanding emptiness, getting started anyway. If the base itself, this place where these Dharma teachings are being given, were root institute, there'd be no need to give it the name. No need. It was naturally, uh, naturally its name automatically. No, some schools think that thing, the base is actually, it's uh, wrong. One names root institute on the base that is not root institute. It is the same with AIDS or any disease you want to name. The base, the illness is not AIDS, it is the base. So what is AIDS? AIDS is the label. The label and the base cannot be one. The aggregates and the I are not one. They are different. Here's the point he's trying to make. The aggregates, my body, my body, thoughts, feelings, the whole schmear, is not I. The aggregates and the I are not one. They are different. They are not separate. 
but they are different. They are not one. It's the same with AIDS. So what is AIDS? It is, a, it is different from the base. In reality, AIDS is never the AIDS one's think, one thinks of is real from its own side. There's no such AIDS. It is completely empty, existing in mere name. Meditate on the emptiness of cancer and other diseases in the same way. That is difficult. You have to really go around this a couple of times to think. I'm trying to get a handle on it. But it's, these are exercises we don't need scholarly uh, terms to understand, or this or that, Sanskrit words. Walking around language he's using here. There is no way for the label to arise without thinking first of the reasons. What are we calling it that for? After seeing a particular form, you then impute a particular label. When we label anything, we think of the characteristics of the object or person, and then we apply the label. The base comes first, of course. We think of or see the base first, then we apply a label to it. This evolution proves that the base is not the label, the label comes later. If the base were the label, it would be crazy to label it again. Making the same point, but he's, this is preaching. This is in person talking. There will be no reason to label it. You will just be duplicating. To think about the base and the label as different is another brief way to meditate on emptiness. This is a clear and essential way to get some feeling for emptiness. Practice awareness of this. So, it was a class now. We'd say, all right, class, five minutes. Why don't you just uh, But you can do this at home on your own or wherever you walk around. So, to think about the base, I'll repeat what he said, these three lines. To think about the base and the label as different is another brief way to meditate on emptiness. Simple. This is a clear and essential way to get some feeling for emptiness. Practice awareness of this. You have to sit in the room and all this as you walk about. Emptiness of the five aggregates on page 101. The aggregates are not the eye. We heard that already. You got to hear it. <laughs> the aggregates are not the eye. It is nothing other than what is merely imputed on the eye, rather. It is nothing other than what is merely imputed on the aggregates. So the eye is empty, completely empty. It's just a label. It's not the whole thing itself. When we say the aggregates, quote, since the base is not the aggregates, well, what are the aggregates then? The aggregates are nothing other than what is merely imputed, so they are completely empty. Go through the aggregates one by one. The base on which we label form is not form, so what is form? It is nothing other than what is merely imputed, so form is completely empty. Imputed means to put something that's not there, to imagine, to, to give it a status it doesn't have, etc. The evolution of imputation is a Tibetan word that means to attach feathers to an, a, an arrow. You're making an arrow, and the feathers aren't there, but you then put them in. That's adding something, and they took that word and made impute. In the English translators, they're calling it imp imputation. I always tell you the story of Rato Chungla Rupeshe was given paintings. One of them was just a square. And everybody was told, oh, that's valuable, that's valuable. He says, I didn't understand. I saw just a square. I said, that's nothing special. I can draw a square. But everyone started telling him, oh, Bantangalu, that's a big painting. Oh, 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 oh. He says, now after all this, now I think it's very important. This is very valuable. Imputation. He went like that to me. Oh. <laughs> of course, I didn't realize the full meaning then, many years ago, suddenly coming around to it. But I see what he meant there. There was very kind of take time out. <laughs> then feeling. What about feelings? I feel tired. No. Feeling in Buddhism is pleasure, pain, or neutral. The base on which we label feeling is not feeling, so what is feeling? It is nothing other than what is merely imputed, so feeling is completely empty. Then recognition, or discriminating awareness, we would say. Again, the base on which we label recognition is not recognition, so what is recognition? It is nothing other than what is merely imputed. You can make this into a, <laughs> almost a repeated poem. Then compounded aggregates, so compositional factors, we would say. Compounded aggregates comprise all the rest of the impermanent phenomena that are not included in the other aggregates of form, feeling, recognition, consciousness, such as, what are they? Phenomena such as the other secondary mental factors, persons, imprints, time, and so forth are included in this category of compounded aggregates. You have all the mental constructs, time, etc., in there. They pile everything into that. 
And don't remember, remember by the way, aggregate means groups of things, piles of things, pong bowl, like into that. So they are not just solitary things, they are groupings of things. Again, the base on which we label come is not the compounded aggregates. So what are the compounded aggregates? Merely that which is merely imputed. So the compounded aggregates are completely empty. And now we come to consciousness. The base on which we label consciousness is not the consciousness. So what is consciousness? The de definition I gave before is the base, but the base is not the label consciousness. To our mind, and here's a, a good punchline, to our mind with everything, the the base and the label seems to be seem to be mixed or one. Our names, there's George, he's a pain in the neck. There's George, he's a great guy. George is just a name. That is the object to be refuted. To our, I'll say it again, this is very key to, to meditating properly. To our mind, the base and the label seem to be mixed or to be one. That is the object to be refuted. The object that we have to realize is empty as it is empty in reality. To our mind, they appear as one. The base and the label don't appear to be different, but in reality, they are. Start with that. Easy to understand the concept. Now, we try it out over and over again because the mind, yeah, I know, and then it goes on, and you're still in sense out. So take some time and bring this to mind all the time, these little teachings. He worked so hard in his life. The least we could do is try and meet him part of the way. He never not worked. The little I heard, all the anecdotes I heard about him, and the couple of times I saw him, there was no wasted split second at all, always given the Dharma. Amazing. He continues, next paragraph. Again, the particular characteristics and function of the consciousness are the base. So what is the consciousness? It is nothing other than what is merely imputed. For example, the eye walks, eats, sleeps, sits, builds houses, but this does not mean that the eye is the aggregates. The same logic can be followed with the consciousness. It performs the function of perceiving objects and so forth, but it is nothing other than what is merely imputed on that particular base, with those particular characteristics and functions. Just as the activities of the aggregates are given the label, I am doing this and that, the actions of this particular base are referred to as consciousness, just like all the other aggregates. Consciousness is completely empty. Now emptiness of the six sense objects. I'm checking the time because I want to get through this text tonight. <laughs> First form. Again, the base is not form. Form is something different from the base. So what is it? Again, it's nothing other than what is merely imputed. So form is completely empty. It's like a prayer that he's saying here. Get it? Are you getting it? <laughs> All these things we call form are com forms are completely empty. For our minds, form cannot be differentiated from the base. We, It is one oneness with the base. For instance, he gives an example. If we look at a piece of bamboo, we label form on the bamboo. But for us, the base, bamboo, and the form cannot be differentiated. We see the base and the form as one mixed. That's a problem. That is the object to be refuted. He's repeating what we already got, but you got to do it this way. We do not recognize the appearance of true existence. We see not simply imputed form, but form having existence from its own side. When we look at and think of the bamboo, to our minds, the base and bamboo appear the same. I'm not talking about people for whom there's no longer appearance of true existence. Not yogis. No, 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 no. But the average person. Here we are. I am talking only of those who do not see the base and bamboo as different. So that is how the object to be refuted appears. When we see a form in reality, we see the base. We don't see form, which is the label. The base is not the imputed existent form. So what is form? It is nothing other than what is merely imputed. Therefore, form is completely empty. Last part of this chapter, he's going to give you a very good example, and we could check to see if we can handle it, we have an idea of emptiness or not. Then sound. Again, there's the base of which we label as interesting sound, uninteresting sound, praise, criticism. Again, the words that we label sound are not sound. So what is sound? It is nothing other than what is merely imputed by the mind. Again, sound is completely empty. Next, smell. Oh, yeah, yeah. The particular sense object experienced by the nose is labeled smell. That is the base, not the label smell. We label smell on what the nose experiences, that which is not experienced by the other senses. That is the base, not the label, the imputed existence, the imputed existence smell. So what is smell? Smell is nothing other than what is merely 
You got it imputed by the mind. Again, smell is completely empty. You should have a beat behind this thing. It would be very good. You can actually... Same with taste. It's labeled on what the sense of the tongue experiences and that other senses do not experience. The base itself is not the taste, so taste is labeled. So what is taste? Nothing other than what is merely imputed by the mind, so taste is completely empty. Touch is the same way. Label them what the physical body experiences through contact. That which is not experienced by other senses. Again, touch is merely empty, imputed by the mind. Therefore, touch is also em completely empty. Emptiness of the Four Noble Truths. Wow. True suffering, the three types of suffering, suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and pervasive compounded suffering, is merely imputed by the mind. Therefore, true suffering is completely empty. It is if there, it is as if there is no true suffering. You know, in Buddhist sect, we pray there's nothing to know and all this. He more or less hinted at no inherent existence. True cause of suffering is merely imputed to karma and delusion. I didn't explain that well, but when we talk about the Four Noble Truths, we say, you know, this is suffering, you should eliminate it, but there's nothing to eliminate. The third repetition, that's what he's saying. He's hinting that there's no inherent existence there. True cause of suffering is merely imputed to karma and delusions. Yes, it comes from a cause. Therefore, true cause of suffering is completely empty as if it doesn't exist. We don't realize it comes from something, it's cause, we give it a rock-hard reality. It's cause. It's empty. It's empty from that appearance to us. That's a rock-hard reality. When we think that way, we're in a claustrophobic situation. How the hell can we improve? We see reality, we get out of that prison, the mental prison. True cessation of suffering or liberation, which the mental continuum is purified of all the disturbing thought obscurations, is nothing other than what is merely imputed by the mind. Therefore, true cessation is completely empty as if it doesn't exist. True path is labeled on the wisdom that directly perceives emptiness. Shocking here. here. Since true path is nothing other than what is merely imputed by, by the mind, again, true path is completely empty of existence from its own side, existing from its own side. All these... True suffering, true cause of suffering, true cessation, and true path are nothing other than what is merely imputed by the mind. So they are completely empty of existing from their own side. When you meditate on the essence of wisdom, that's a text, and I don't know exactly what that is. No, i got to find it. Go over each aggregate and each sense object. Meditate on each point. Apply the reasoning that, reasoning that each one is empty because it is, it is merely imputed. This will automatically make you feel that it is empty. Concentrate on the empty. So here's where he's using logic and this repetitive stuff to bring up this feeling, oh yeah, that isn't the way I think it is. The start of freedom. Concentrate on the emptiness. The more deeply you understand the meaning of merely imputed, that's not easy to understand. The meaning of merely imputed, or of subtle dependent arising, the more deeply you understand emptiness. This is the way things are. When we practice awareness of this, it is another world. When we are not aware of reality, we live in one world, truly existent I, living a truly existent life in a truly existent world, wherever you are. <laughs> when we don't see reality, we live our life as truly existent I, which, by the way, doesn't exist. Excuse me. He put it in parentheses, so I did that. With truly existent aggregates, which don't exist, and truly existent sense objects of form, smell, t sound, taste, touch, which don't exist. We believe in truly existent true suffering, which doesn't exist, truly existent, true cause of suffering, which doesn't exist. <laughs> Repeat over that mantra here. We think of real negative karma from its own side, which doesn't exist. Real liberation from its own side, which doesn't exist. This is liberation, but not from its own side. And the real path that we are meditating upon, which doesn't exist. So here's the punchline to the whole chapter. And he quotes the Bodhisattva Togme Zangpo, the one who wrote 37 practices of, of the Nulchu something he's called. 37 Practices of Bodhisattva. Here's his quote. And he's an old timer. He's been around the world. Togme Zangpo says, Even though I can sit up here on a throne and talk a lot about emptiness, if someone criticizes or praises me a little, my mind goes crazy. Even though I can say that uh, the words, nothing that appears as true existence, like and dislike arise with just a little praise. Like and dislike arise with just a little praise or criticism. He breaks the thing. Not one single practice can be called the path of the middle way once he has that feeling. So this is something. If we have a true realization of emptiness, someone praises, someone criticizes, we don't care. Ah, seeing everything is empty. We don't care about labels. Are you a Buddhist? Our teachers say, no, I'm not Buddhist, I'm Muslim. 
He's trying to tell us. It's a label. See the difference. So, Lama Zopa comments on that now. He sits on a throne and talks about emptiness. Yet he's praised or blamed. He, he gets a little emotional. He, he loses his cool. So Lama Zopa says, you may be able to recite by heart and brilliantly explain the whole of Madhyamaka, all Nagarjuna's teachings on emptiness, all Lama Sankapa's teachings on, a great, on greater insight, all the perfection of wisdom teachings, all the teachings on the wisdom gone beyond. Whoa! But in daily life, if someone says something a little negative or a little positive, offers a little criticism or a little praise, immediately the mind becomes emotional. It loses its cool. There is no stability. And he didn't say that. I'm saying losing. The mind becomes emotional. There is no stability. Immediately there, there is like and dislike. Well, that doesn't exist. In this. If this is what happens to our mind in daily life, there's not even a particle of practice of the right view. All right, so now we got a good uh, way to test ourselves. <laughs> Bob, you're a great guy. You're the best guy ever. <laughs> you're terrible. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> We're fooling around. All right, back to work. Be aware that all these, quote, real things that appear to exist on their own side are empty. Understand that they are all hallucinations, which means that they are all empty. In short, all causative phenomena are transitory by nature, and they are empty by nature. Causative, it's cause, it's temporary. It has the, within it, the uh, seeds of its cessation. So, all causative phenomena are transitory by nature, and they are empty by nature, both. Important distinction, and it's subtle. Impermanence, realization of impermanence, knocking on the door of emptiness, it's not a realization of emptiness. So he mentions both, otherwise he would just say, so he says, all in short, all causative phenomena are transitory by nature, and they are empty by nature. When you do not practice awareness of this in day-to-day -day life, the mind is overwhelmed by hallucinations, by wrong conceptions, like a city flooded by water. He's saying the mind is not operating the way it's supposed to, we're just like on the water. The mind is possessed by wrong thoughts, wrong appearance, wrong view. As long as the mind is overwhelmed by wrong conceptions, there is no real peace. Life is lived in hallucination. Not seeing everything as illusory is the fundamental hallucination. The people who have not realized emptiness and do not see things as illusory not only see everything as truly existent, which is an illusion, but also experience the basic problem of clinging to everything as if it were true. We have this problem. The, this wrong conception, this ignorance, is the origin of all other delusions, which then motivate karma. That karma leaves on the mind the seed. That karma leaves on the mind the seeds that are the causes of samsara. So the view causes are horrible situations. Like this, the ignorance believing that everything exists from its own side ties you continuously to samsara, so that from life to life you experience the three types of suffering. Besides that. It interferes with your achieving liberation and enlightenment and with your ability to fill the wishes of all sentient beings by be leading them to the peerless happiness of full enlightenment, let alone your own enlightenment. You can't do anything for others. Not the slightest benefit comes from following this ignorance for you or for others, only harm. Believing this ignorance is completely childish when in reality no such truly existent phenomena exist. By nature, all phenomena are empty, empty by nature. Bishay repeated that millions of times to us. Everything is without true existence, so it is complete nonsense for your mind to apprehend it as true just because it appears truly existent. This is unnecessary and meaningless, and the shortcomings are infinite. The harm this ignorance causes you is enormous. There is no reason at all to follow ignorance which apprehends everything as truly existent and believes in that appearance of true existence. And there is no point at all in allowing discriminating thoughts of attachment and anger to arise. I like, I don't like, blah, blah. play those games and you go nuts. No eye to cherish is the last part of this chapter. We're in the final minute or so. Because in reality the eye is completely empty, there is nothing to cherish. Look at the eye as empty, then check whether there is any object to cherish. Since the eye that exists is merely imputed upon the base of the aggregate, there is nothing to cherish nothing to cling to. If you check, self-cherishing is completely silly and only creates problems. Although you don't want problems, you create problems. Self-cherishing is a dictatorship. Beguile. 
Self-charity is a dictatorship. It is dictatorship meant to be benefit the self, but one that results in only problems and failure. It's not logical. Check. Why do I cherish myself? Why do I think that I'm more important than all the numberless other sentient beings? Why do I think I'm so precious? Yeah, because I am. Yeah. No. Why do I think I'm so precious? He's asking. There is not one valid reason for self-cherishing. Someone said that uh, self-cherishing is ignorance in action. <laughs> Though we can give many reasons why we should cherish others, we cannot find one reason why we should cherish ourselves. He's hitting the Bodhisattva trail. There is nothing important or precious about, quote, the I. Just like you, other sentient beings want happiness and do not want sufferings. Others are numberless. You're just one person. Your own self-importance is completely lost when you think of the numberless others. It is nothing that's very good to do. Here's an example. Think of others suffering. Away goes your own. Oh, nobody doesn't like me. Goes away. Even if you are born in hell, you are the only one person. There's nothing to be depressed about. Even if you achieve liberation from Sarah, you some Sarah, you are only one person. So there's no reason to get excited. When you think of the numberless others who like you want happiness and do want do not want suffering, you become completely insignificant. Therefore, in your life, there is nothing other to do than to work for others to cherish others. With this attitude, work for other sentient beings with your body, speech, and mind. There is nothing more important in your life than this. And boy, did he live that. And this guy just didn't talk, this Lama. <sighs> Bless his heart, and I hope to see him soon. We all do. And as I said before, look at all the centers that he spawned. The great Geshe Namdak, these people, the Jam Young Center people, the Suravasti Abbey people. Oh, my God. It's it's endless. His hard, honest, hard work, sincere benefits us all. So who are we praying for? Let me look at the, the chart right away. I should elect, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. I can't see many names. We have so many people who have died just in all the wars, accidents, shootings in the United States. Hey, the shooting capital of the world, the USA. Insanity. We need this teaching. <laughs> I prostrate to the omniscient one, Sutra the Three Jewels we're reading. Thus the Buddha, Bhagavata, Tathagata, Arahat, Samyak, Sang, Bodha, Buddha, the learned and virtuous one, the Sugata, the knower of the world, the charioteer and tamer of beings, the unsurpassable one, the teacher of devas and humans, is the Buddha, Bhagavat. The Tathagata is in accord with all merit, does not waste the roots of virtue. He is completely ornamented with all patience. He is the basis of the treasures of merit. He is adorned with the minor marks. He blossoms with the flowers of the major marks. His activity is timely and appropriate. Seeing him, he is without disharmony. He brings true joy to those who long with faith. His knowledge cannot be overpowered. His strengths cannot be challenged. He is the teacher of all sentient beings. He is the father of bodhisattvas. He is the king of noble ones. He is the guide of those who journey to the city of Nirvana. He possesses immeasurable wisdom. He possesses inconceivable confidence. His speech is completely pure. His melody is pleasing. One never has enough of seeing him. His form is incomparable. He's not stained by the realm of desire. He's not stained by the realm of form. He's not affected by the formless realm. He is completely liberated from suffering. He is completely and utterly liberated from the skandhas. He is not possessed with datus. His ayatanas are controlled. He has completely cut the knots. He is completely liberated from extreme torment. He is liberated from craving. He's crossed over the river. He is perfected in all the wisdoms. He abides in the wisdom of the Buddha Bhagavats who rise in the past, present, and future. He does not abide in nirvana. He abides in the ultimate perfection. He dwells on the Bhumi where he sees all sentient beings. All these are the perfect virtues of the greatness of the Buddha Bhagavat. The Holy Dharma is good at the beginning, good in the middle, and good at the end. Its meaning is excellent. Its words are excellent. It is uncorrupted. It is completely perfect and completely pure. It completely purifies. The Bhagavad teaches the Dharma well. It brings complete vision. It is free from sickness. It is always timely. It directs one further, seeing it fulfills one's purpose. It brings discriminating insight for the wise. The Dharma, which is taught by the Bhagavad, is revealed properly in the Vinaya. It is renunciation. It causes one to arrive at perfect enlightenment. It is without contradiction. It is pity. It is trustworthy and puts an end to the journey. As for the song of the great Yana, they enter completely. They enter insightfully. They enter straightforwardly. They enter harmoniously. They are worthy of veneration with joined palms. They are worthy of receiving prostration. They are a field of glorious merit. They are completely capable of receiving all gifts. 
They're an object of generosity. They're a great object of complete generosity. The protector who possesses great kindness, the omniscient teacher, the basis of oceans of merit and virtue, I prostrate to the Tathagata. Pure the cause of freedom from passion, virtuous, liberating from the lower realms. This alone is the supreme ultimate truth. I prostrate to the Dharma, which is peace. Having been liberated, they show the path to liberation. They are fully dedicated to the disciplines. They are a holy field of merit and possess virtue. I prostrate to the Sangha. I prostrate to the Buddha, the leader. I prostrate to the Dharma, the protector. I prostrate to the Sangha, the community. I prostrate respectfully and always to these three. The Buddha's virtues are inconceivable. The Dharma's virtues are inconceivable. The Sangha's virtues are inconceivable. Having faith in these inconceivable Therefore, the fruitions are inconceivable. You got it. May I be born in a completely pure No, may they be born in a completely pure realm. I have to think before I just look at the page. Now, as a further cause for the quick return of Rafa Chungla, Rinpoche's Holy Dalai Lama recommends we say this prayer for the flourishing of Jay Sankapa's teachings. Darren, thanks for making new copies. He's not there anymore, I guess. It's on the website. Though he's the father producer of all conquerors, as a conqueror's son, he produced the thought of upholding the conqueror's dharma in infinite worlds. Through this truth, may the conqueror Lasang's teachings flourish. When of yore in the presence of Buddha Indra Kedu, he made his vow, the conqueror and his offspring praised this powerful courage. Through this truth, may the conqueror Lasang's teachings flourish. That the lineage of pure view and conduct might spread, he offered a white crystal rosary to the sage who gave him a conch and prophesied, through this truth, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. His pure view free of eternity or destruction, his pure meditation cleansed of dark fading and fog, his pure conduct practiced according to the conqueror's orders, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Learn, since he extensively sought out learning, reverent, rightly applying it to himself. Good, dedicating all for beings in the doctrine, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Through being sure that all scriptures, definitive and interpretive, or without contradiction, advice for one person's practice, he stopped all misconduct. May the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Listening to explanation of the three patakas, realized teachings, practice of the three trainings, his skilled and accomplished life story is amazing. May the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Outwardly calmed and subdued by the hearer's conduct, inwardly trusting in the two stages practice of Tantra. He allied without clash the good paths of Sutra and Tantra, May the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Combining voidness explained as the causal vehicle with great bliss achieved by method, the effect vehicle, heart essence of 80,000 Dharma bundles, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. By the power of the ocean of oath-bound doctrine protectors, like the main guardians of the three beings' paths, the quick-acting lord, Vaishravana, Karmayama, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. In short, by the lasting of glorious gurus' lives, by the earth being full of good learned reverend holders of the teaching, and by the increase of power of its patrons, may the conqueror of Losang's teachings flourish. Now, eight verses on training the mind. By Geshe Langtri Tangpa, who was always crying. With the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings who surpass even a wish-granting jewel, I will learn to hold them supremely dear. Whenever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all, and respectfully hold others to be supreme from the very depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind, and as soon as a disturbing emotion arises, endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those oppressed by strong misdeeds and sufferings, as if I had found the precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer the victory to them. When the one whom I have benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone without exception all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectfully take upon myself all harm and suffering of my mothers. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns and by understanding all phenomena as light illusions, be released from the bondage of attachment. So our next presentation will be Saturday afternoon, the 15th? No, it's Monday the 15th, 22nd. Whatever it is, this is coming Saturday, 1 o'clock here at the Parsonage in South Orange, the uh, White Tara Long Life Meditation that we do. Everyone is welcome. On our website are the instructions 
to how to get here, uh, and refreshments are served. It lasts about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and then we have refreshments, and then at 3 o'clock, a half hour, if you're still here, 3 or 3.30, half hour silent meditation, or just silence. So thank you for your kind patience. a difficult topic, but we couldn't let Lama Zopa just go. We just wish to please come back. We have to get a taste of his teachings so we feel closer to him, and he'll come back, I think. Anyway, bless all of his centers, bless all his work. I mean, so grateful for all those teachers that he spawned. Big love to all of you. Take care, guys.